Welcome to the Membership Guys podcast. Kick-ass advice and tips for membership site owners. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 155 of the Membership Guys podcast. I'm your host, Mike Morrison, and you are in the right place for proven practical tips and advice on running and growing a successful membership business. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by my good friend, Mark Asquith, co-founder of Podcast Websites, and he's also founder of The Movement, which is his own coaching membership group, too. Now, I've known Mark for a good number of years. We've become good friends and we often talk about all different sides of business. But the main reason I want him on today's show is to share a bit of his journey from being an agency owner where he was working one-on-one with clients. He had a staff and he had a lot of big name clients on the books. But making that switch from running that type of business to running a subscription business where he was serving on a one-to-many basis. Now, while Mark's core business, podcastwebsites.com, is technically a SaaS business, it's software as a service, there is a membership aspect to it, and Mark does also run a separate coaching membership too. So he's been through the journey of starting, running, and growing a membership, as well as a subscription-based software company as well. And this is something that I know a lot of you guys listening are either going through that journey, you've been through it, or you're potentially facing having to make the transition between working one-on-one with clients as a coach, a consultant, an agency owner, or whatever you're doing in your business, you're looking to potentially move from that into a completely different business model. So Mark and I had the chance to talk about both of our journeys and also the decision-making, the practicalities, and the mental changes that you need to go through when you're making that sort of switch. It's a real value-packed interview, and I'm sure you're going to find Mark's journey and the stories along the way familiar and also interesting and entertaining too. So let's get right to it and jump into my conversation with Mark Asquith. So my guest today is a serial entrepreneur who spent over a decade building several successful design, marketing, software, and digital businesses. He's a popular podcaster, global speaker, co-founder of podcastwebsites.com, and all-round decent bloke. Plus, he has an accent only marginally sillier than mine. I'm very, very happy to welcome to the show, Mr. Mark Asquith. How are you doing, my man? It really is a weirdly silly accent, isn't it? It is. It is. It makes me kind of it makes me feel quite good like i don't know if this is going to work for the show or against the show because i kind of feel like the weird accent is part of the selling point for the show i'm not sure if doubling up makes it a better show or dilutes it a little bit i think it might just be one of those where people are just did you hear that that show that was in spanish last week <laughs> from mike where you couldn't tell anything that was going on for 30 minutes that was a good one i think yeah. that's going to be the outcome of this yeah it's this doubling up the novelty factor yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah, like two Christmas jumpers. You can only, you can't, <laughs> no point wearing one. Wear two. <laughs> yeah, one over the other one. Yeah. All right. So we're off to a good start. Um, all right. Now, obviously, we get the chance to hang out a fair amount. You know, I know <clears throat> you stalking me around conferences in the UK and the US and all that stuff. Uh, so, yeah, I, I know we could be here for hours putting the business world to rights. But what I really want to focus on in this episode is the fact that a few years back, you were running a very successful, very profitable digital agency. Money coming in, great client list, staff, officers, the works. But you moved away from all of that and you transitioned into the world of SaaS and, to a, a smaller degree, memberships. So I want to talk a little bit about that decision, but more importantly, that journey, because it's similar in a lot of ways to our own with the membership guys. We went from agency to running the membership. And of course, a lot of people in our audience are experts and influencers in their own rights who are running one type of business, be it an agency, coaching or whatever. And they want to make that transition to running a membership for like full time. So Let's get started just telling us a little bit about where you were with the agency, what all of that looked like, and when your eyes started wandering towards an alternative path. Yeah, it's it's a good question. It's a it's you know, you could sort of trace it as far back as even starting the agency. Mm -hmm. Um but to put as you said, to put it into context, you know, we were doing well, we 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 were doing all right. And we I think every business goes through certain breakpoints of growth. You know, I think you 
I think you, you, you know, you hit your first break point, you've got to make a decision. Do I go from being a one man band to being something else? And then you step up a level and, 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 the, you know, you, you, you put structures in place, you put processes in place and you put people in place that can help you with that. And then you get to the next break point, the next break point, the next break point. And at each break point, you kind of got to decide which way do you want to go? Do you want to stay the same? Do you want to go back? You know, sometimes getting bigger is not good. Um, you know, you, you actually become less profitable by being bigger very often when it comes to, to running a small business. Oh, you've got to decide, do I want to become more profitable? And what does that look like? What kind of work do I want to be doing? And it's that last part that really kind of struck me. I know you, you and I have spoken about this because we've got quite a, a, a sort of similar background in this. Mm. but. Ultimately, it's, it's if you think about why you, you you sort of set your own business up. If you if your mum asked you why did you set your own business up, you wouldn't say it was to do work that I didn't like doing. You'd never say that. Like it's it's a, it's a ridiculous answer. But I think if you're not careful, you you sort of find yourself a little bit trapped by the work, and that's that's what I found myself doing. Like I said, we built a decent agency, we had some good clients, and we could have put the foot down and really excelled. You know, we had a great designer, um, creative director, Kai. We had some some team members that, there that were, were, frankly, at that time, struggling to figure out, actually, where do I need to be? What do I need to be doing? What, what do I want to contribute to the business? Um, and when you throw in that mix of, do you know what? I've kind of, I've been, I've been doing service-based work for the last 12 years. Um, and it's, it's that constant chase. It's that constant sell, you know, when you weigh up all those options, it got, it got to the point where I was just thinking, okay, well, I wouldn't say that I don't want to do this anymore, but maybe, I don't know, three years ago, I started thinking maybe it's time to just start looking around. Um, you know, from my side, it's, it's, it's always been about a bit of property, you know, that's, that's very much, um, something that I focus on is, is getting some property in the portfolio. Do I focus on building a personal brand? You know, where do I put that time and attention? And it just so happened at that time that one of my friends, Gaz said to me, do you want to start a podcast? I was like, no, why would I start a podcast? It's not 2005 and Lost's not on TV anymore. What are we going to talk about? And it was one of those things where. He just said, look, dude, just get this microphone. So, he, so I've got the microphone. I'm like, yes, guys. And uh, he, 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 he made me podcast. And that was 2014. So I kind of, th th this dovetailed with this, just this feeling that we could do a little bit more in the agency. But me thinking, do I really want to? Um, so we started this podcast and then we, it, it did well. You know, it, it didn't do crazy numbers but it did enough to make me think holy crap i can actually talk about things that i like talking about and people are going to listen to it like what else could i do with this so i started my own business podcast um under my own personal brand just as a way of sharing what i was doing in the agency just as a way of interviewing people and talking to people and you know no intent to do anything else but they're just these two kind of sides of my world dovetailed together, this new exciting podcasting game. And then this, this kind of just this feeling of, do I want to be chasing the invoice all the time? You know? So that's, that's, I guess where that feeling of discontent came from. Um, and it really just, it kind of manifested on a whim really. I'm, I mean, you know me, I'm, I'm sort of a, let's get it done. Let's test it. Let's see if it works. And if not, you know, no, harm, no foul. Um, so we set this, we set this this platform up called Podcast Websites just purely because, like, we got experience in web. Um, a great friend of mine and, and now my business partner, Kieran, worked at the agency, and I said to him, look, why don't we just put this quick idea together? We'll take it to John, uh, John Lee Dumas over at EOFI. He's got a big audience. Why don't we just – we'll ask him if he wants to partner on it, and if he does, we'll test it on his audience. If it works, we'll see if we can do anything with it. And then suddenly it worked. Like, instantly it worked. We'd not even <laughs> built the thing. Um, so – that was the real kind of crossroads. It was at that point that I was like, wait a second. In this one sort of one hour webinar or this one hour sales kind of process, we'd signed up, what did I, I can't remember what we signed up, 100 and something members. Wow. Yeah, it was great, man. And they were all paying. We, I mean, we gave them a massive discount. I think the, the most they were paying were 47 bucks a month. Um, there were a few paying like 25 or 27, a couple paying 10, where we'd sort of ramped up the, if you sign up for the beta, you get access to the, the you know, the ultimate discount and then ramped them up that way. Um, but it just did well from, from day one. And I was like, what, what's just happened? <laughs> Well, what has just happened? And then I got, you know, I got back to the agency the next day and then there's some, some numpty saying, oh, can you knock us 1,500 quid off this website? Of course, Dave's mate can do it for me down pub. Like, what, 
what is what's going on? And yeah. like that was the real catalyst for me at that point. I mean, that was 2014. You know, I'm be under be under no illusion that it, it, it didn't take a long time for me to work this out in my head. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I was 2014 doing this, and only 2017 did I end up leaving the agency. So wow. I mean, that's a it's a long gestation period because it was yeah. it was scary, man. Yeah, I hadn't realised that it had been over over that time frame. Had you started? winding down your involvement in the agency over that period or was it a case of trying to juggle both at the same time and ultimately hitting a, a breaking point so i think actually two two there are two kind of sides to that again another bit of dovetailing number one we hit a plateau with podcast websites where we had to make the decision do we go full time at this thing but at the same time as that, I'm, I'm quite a process-oriented guy. I like to be able to work on the business, not in the business, because I, I, I just see the value of doing that. Uh, and I mean, you, you know, you and I have masterminded together. You know that I still really struggle with that, that ability to be able to do that, putting the right structure in place and putting the team in place to be able to move the business forward. So I was trying to do that at Hacksaw. You know, we, we, you know being totally frank, there was maybe 40% of the team firing on all cylinders and the rest just dialing it in. And yeah. it was at the point that I was like, wait a second here. I'm the one that's really pushing this thing and wanting to really dial this thing in with with Kai, the creative director. Why bother, really, in a really crass way, why bother splitting the brass? Why why bother <laughs> doing this? Um, so at the same time as hitting that bit of a growth plateau with podcast websites where we had to make a conscious decision of, of do we push this or not? You know, is it a hobby or is it a business? Um, I was also having the feeling of, uh, you know, maybe I'm working a little bit too hard on the wrong things at the agency. Mm. And then the third thing that cropped up was, I think I've, by the way, I think I've made a phrase up here, um, <laughs> which I, I talk about in my podcast a bit, which is I'd, I'd found myself kind of in this lifestyle prison, and I'll explain that, where I'd set this business up and I'd set this agency up, and yeah, I was getting paid well. It was fine. I was doing all right. You know, could have lived on that forever, done fine. But it was kind of boring. And I didn't want to push that business because of the issues that we were having. But at the same time, I had built this really nice lifestyle. Mm. I enjoyed what I was doing and the, the ability, like I'm not, even though I've got, you know, Kieran will take the mick out of me for having a fancy car. Now I didn't have a fancy car then, don't have a fancy house. It was just, I like to be able to travel, like to be able to enjoy what I was doing. Um, like to be able to save uh, what I want to save to invest in some property. And I was just like, okay, this is nice. But that was imprisoning me. So I, th I was thinking to myself at the same time, like, holy crap, how do I get out of this thing without sacrificing the lifestyle? Because let's be honest, you know, all the books that you get that are like, if you don't just dive in off the cliff edge and quit your job and set your own business up, then you're nothing. You know, all those <laughs> books that tell you that. That's yeah, it's fine. The whole, yeah, it's the whole no risk, no reward kind of thing. No guts, no glory, all of that. It's it's 80s movies as well. It is. It's not just business books. It's 80s kung fu movies. <laughs> It is, which are awesome, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's one of those things where, like, unless you're 25, that's really not that great advice. Yeah. Because you've built – it's not like you've built your life by accident. You've done it on purpose. So a lot of people, I think that, you know, a lot of people need to stop worrying about the stigma around that. Like, you, you, <laughs> you like your life. It's not your life that you don't like. It's the fact that you spend most of your time doing work that's unfulfilling. And that's the point that I was in. I was in this lifestyle prison where my lifestyle was great. I was loving it, but it was imprisoning me because I needed the financial to maintain that lifestyle. Um, and then it just it just really got to a point where podcast websites, the business, was able to pay me the same amount of money because we worked our asses off on it. And it was able to pay me that money. And I was able to say, Do you know what? Actually, I don't need this anymore. Um, you know, and it, sure, I could have kept both businesses running and drawn down two lots of dividends and, you know, and earned double the money and that have grown, both of them grown fine. But it's not you, and you know this better than anyone, it's not about what's in the bank. Yeah. It's actually about, do I have enough in the bank to live a damn good life how I want to live it, but also be able to do what I want on a Thursday morning and not have to worry about it, you know? So that was that was the kind of, uh, the, the catalyst for it, really. Yeah, and that's an important thing for people to hear because that, that notion of if you're not always chasing, if you're not always risking it all and trying to get more, you know, when, <coughs> you, you'll see constantly, at least once a week, in Facebook groups, on social, whatever, people debating about what the word entrepreneur means and you're guaranteed you'll get a whole bunch of people who define that as well 
you're only an entrepreneur if you're risking stuff, if you're risking money, if you're, you know, if you're essentially gambling. And and that creates what you're saying there, that stigma that if you're not always pushing, if you're not always taking a chance and taking a risk, then you're not a proper entrepreneur, which is, is nonsense. Because Oh, it is. <laughs> you know, we see we see the realities of that, and both of us have been in this game long enough to have seen the realities of that and how it bears out over time. And you know, again, with membership owners, obviously a lot of this I'm sure will be very, very familiar to people who haven't <clears throat> yet made that transition into running a membership full time or maybe haven't started exploring the membership model because they have a business that has taken their attention that perhaps they're unhappy with. But also people who are running memberships where they're always hearing from marketers or business advisors or coaches, okay, well, it's not enough to just have a membership. You also need to have a coaching program. You need to have a $20,000 retreat. Otherwise, you're leaving money on the table. I think sometimes people need to understand that it's kind of, it's okay to leave money on the table. Of course it is. I mean, you only eat, you only eat when you're hungry. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, if, if you and me got a gauchos, and, you know, you've had that beautiful state, but you leave a third of it. It's not like you've not enjoyed it or had enough or really savoured it. It just means that actually you've you reached your limit. Yeah. And if you'd eaten it, you wouldn't have enjoyed it. You'd be uncomfortable. You'd be stuffed and bloated and it wouldn't be a good outcome. Exactly. And that, yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a, you know, the world's funny at the minute. Like the word entrepreneur is absolute. It's just horse crap because... Like so many people, I know so many people that quit business to be an entrepreneur. And a, 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 a friend of mine, who I've not seen for a while actually, he for, he said to me years ago, I reckon probably 10 years ago, um, he said that entrepreneurs don't call themselves entrepreneurs. They just get their shit done. Yeah. Like, and people, not, like I know people, I can think of people who have quit their jobs, teach people how to be entrepreneurs <laughs> without having made a penny themselves. Yeah. And you're just like, what? You, it's like you're chasing the label and the glory and the, you know, you kick the door in and risk everything. I mean, if you think about a poker player, they're not risking everything. They're called poker players. They actually know how to play the game and calculate the risks out. Um, so you've got to, I think you're absolutely right what you're saying. You've got to, one, realize what is enough for you. But also, like, how do you want to live? How do you want to be? How do you want to turn up? How do you want to spend your days? Because we can all... We can all earn millions. That's it's not it's not actually that hard to earn millions. You just have to be willing to be on twenty four seven, or be willing to delegate some of the risk to other people. And they're the two things that people generally don't do in small business. They're not willing to delegate, and or they just they just don't want it. And it's it's, yeah. it's fine. You know, if you can make two hundred grand a year from a membership, three hundred, five hundred, whatever. You're going to do all right off that. That's a pretty good life yeah, for running a membership. It's, it's awesome. You know? It's not bad, is it? <laughs> it's all right. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. If someone said to you when you were 15, right, you're going to earn 200 grand a year, and do you know what? It's going to be awesome. You're going to you're going to be able to work from anywhere. You're going to be able to probably, if you really want to, probably work two, three, three days a week, and you're going to have people that really value you and really enjoy what you're doing, and you're going to be able to travel the world and, and, and see these different places. Like, you'd take it. <laughs> Without, yeah. Without a question, but yeah, it, it you know it it's so much of this just comes back to it not being about how much money you make, but about how you make that money. Mm -hmm. And you know, people who who chase more and more and more and more, the reason why you have so many people getting burned by that, or you know, making millions but being miserable, is because they haven't thought about the how. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think one of the, the big telltales with that as well is that, you know, you see all these people um, that you maybe aspire to and people that, you know, on Instagram look like they've got a bit of brass. And I always think there's a really good litmus test for people that have got it right and people that perhaps are just chasing the cash a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that, that litmus test for me is when you say to them, how are you? If they answer with the word busy, you know that they've probably got it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you want to be answering with the whatever, tired, because why? Well, because I'm jet lag. I've just been to Australia for three weeks. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. that it's how it's how you want to live. If you want to hunt down the millions, crack on. But you can't possibly then get to sixty and think, damn, you know, I yeah. worked forty years and where did it go? Yeah. And the thing is, again, this is so important, I think, for for people to hear, not just in the context of what we're talking about, making that switch from a business where maybe you're not as fulfilled and maybe the how 
of how you make your money isn't what you want it to be, but also for for that growth question, for that scaling question. Because you know, if you're running a membership, if you're running a SaaS company, any type of business, if you're being successful with it, once you've got everything in place and right, you then hit that point at which you don't really know what you're going to do next. You know, do you double down on what you're doing? Do you just keep doing that? Is that okay? Or do you follow what all of these gurus, self-proclaimed, are telling you you need to have? You need to have a product suite. You need to do this. You need to do that. It's perfectly fine if you want to do that. Awesome. You want to build an empire? Fantastic. But it's it's equally valid if you don't want to. If you want to have 50% of your time spent on the couch watching Netflix and playing video games? Awesome. If that's what success means to you, you won the game. Yeah, that's exactly, man. And it's, I always think people define, and, and this is something that I've spoken about recently a, a fair bit, is that people tend to define themselves by what they do day to day. You know, And I've seen this with business partners. I've seen it with, with, with employees and team members over the years. And they kind of get defined by what they want to do. So that means that every single day they'll be like, right, what I do is is kind of the thing that I tell people. is is what defines me. And when you get faced with these decisions, when you get faced with this, do I do a um, you know do I double down and have a bit of a growth spurt? Do I get a new job? Do I look for a new job, or do I not look for a new job? Most people ask the wrong question. Most people will say, "What do I want to do?" What they very rarely do is ask how they want to be or how they want to feel. You know, mm-hmm. do I want to feel like I'm turning up and actually? I'm making a difference or um, I've got responsibility and I'm delivering on that responsibility or that I'm able to leave work at five o'clock on a Friday, having had a really fulfilling week, but also go and just waste my money on, on, on just whiskey. Do you know what I mean? If that's <laughs> the success that you like, every decision has got to be run through that filter. So yeah. when it comes to getting a new job or it comes to do I double down and try and grow the business, does that, does that decision, if I say yes to it, get me one step closer to how I want to be, how I want to feel, or does it just give me more stuff to do, mm. you know? So it's a, it's, a, it's a very important distinction that I think so many small business owners, especially fatigued business owners, people like accountants that have built really big accountancy firms or solicitors that are just like 40-year veterans and they've got, you know, they've got the two, two houses, got the two cars, they go out to Spain three times a year, like they've got that. Yeah. But what's it costing them, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so of course all of this stuff, this is this is where you are mentally with with the agency, with Hacksaw, right? And and kind mm-hmm. of having that eye on what one business podcast website was going to mean in terms of what your day to day was, how it made you feel, what your lifestyle would be, versus still having that foot in in what you call that lifestyle prison. So obviously we talked a bit about uh, about when you reached that point where podcast websites was making as much or, or covering essentially what what Hacksaw uh, would have been making. On a practical level, what did you do? Did you did you put like a date in the diary for when this was going to all go down, when when podcast websites was going to be the sole focus, Hacksaw would go away? Did Was there a transition period? How did you handle all that on a practical level? Talk us through it a bit. Yeah, that's a really good question, man. So we made the decision. It was a hard decision to make. I think looking back, we could have made the decision quicker. Uh, The decision was ultimately, like I went into the guys and said, listen, I think I'm out of this. Um, And ultimately, the goal of this session with you guys is for for me to tell you that and and, and understand that it's a positive thing. But also for you as co-directors, there were four of the co-directors to be able to say, do you want to do you want to take over the leadership of this? Does one of you guys want to step up? And ultimately, weirdly, um, no one did. Um, okay. which was a yeah I know it's odd um, and it was a real testament to my decision because I was second guessing that but the fact that certainly a portion um, of the business was happy to just rely on someone else doing it to draw down a wage you know that yeah, really that's... validated my idea of right I'm done with this you know and, and, and having worked with Kieran Kieran's very similar to me you know we've got very same ideals same morals um, and he's, he's got the same drive and motivation so you know, comparing what we had at podcast websites with that attitude, that was really that that real, not the nail in the coffin, but certainly the straw that broke the camel's back a little bit. Mm. And so we then we put it, we, we did, we put an end date on it. We said, look, by this date, we're going to have stopped trading. Um, we decided what to do with the clients because we, remember we had a, we had a lot of clients, yeah, you know, a lot of clients, um, and they, they, they were ripe to just be taken and, and and just built into something even bigger if they wanted to do it. Um, and it you know it turns out that. Um, 
one of the guys took a few of the clients, another guy took a took a, another few of the clients, and so on and so forth. It was just like this weird little transition. Yeah. Um, but we did. We said, you know, by this date, we will no longer be trading. Whatever it was, November first. Um, We'd be would have wrapped the business up, um, but we're not actually going to take any more revenue after August first. Yeah, um, and then we did. We you know we contacted uh, all the clients or as many as we could get hold of. You know what it's like. Some people just simply you can never get hold of. Um, and we went through that process, told them what was going to happen, um, did all the handovers to whoever we had to do the handovers to, and it, it was all actually pretty smooth. Okay, um, it There's all went no, pretty well. No kickback from any clients who who maybe had worked with you for a while. Were they all quite supportive? Yeah, well, this is another thing. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of um, uh, just skip back a second on the the why in terms of moving to podcast websites full time. The big difference is that do you know what most people, most kind of design agency clients, they're going to swap their agencies every three years anyway, just because they think it's time for a change. Mm-hmm. There's very little loyalty on that. You know, very little loyalty in the agency world. Even if you've got a fantastic client that you really get along with and you're friends with, ultimately at some point they will say it's time for something different. Mm. It's the way of design. It's the way of digital. And the difference with podcast websites was that actually everyone really massively valued what we do. And I mean, you know, with the testimonials, we've got them coming out of our ears. We've got people just thanking us and, you know, not being able to thank us enough for helping them to get launched and, and, and just they'd have never done it without us. You know, you've seen the testimonials that you guys have got. It's a very similar thing. Yeah. Um, so to go back to that question, the reason I prefixed it with that was that, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the clients didn't really care. The clients just did not care. As long as they were well serviced and the site didn't go down and nothing happened and mm. they weren't getting billed for anything and blah, blah, blah. You know, all the, all the kind of really superficial stuff that people care about. As long as that was all in place, do you know what? Didn't matter who was doing it. And yeah. that was, again, another real like, oh, okay. So actually, all this stuff I've been worried about, no one really cares about. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, whether it's obviously with, <clears throat> with podcast websites where it's more of a, a SaaS um, or whether it's with a membership, you're doing less for these people, like directly. You're less involved in their business. And yet, you're absolutely right. We have the same experience. Like, they are more grateful. They are better customers, essentially, than the ones that you work with to a much greater depth you work with um a lot more closely in the agency world we definitely found that that you know i can count on one hand how many like real headache um customers we've had as as members it's an extreme rarity out of thousands of members we certainly had more of those type um of of clients with the agency. And it's odd because you would think that the people you have the the closer relationship with, that those would be your your better type of customers. But it certainly sounds like you've had the same experience as us. That just wasn't the case. Yeah, and actually I'm gonna add on to that because we're this weird hybrid business. So podcast websites is is a, is a SaaS version of WordPress, and we added mm. a hell of a lot to it, and we had a lot of support and a lot of the service side to it. The, the, the next kind of products that we're pushing out, they purely are kind of SaaS-based products or tech-based products. You know, So the podcast websites is this weird hybrid, as you mentioned right at the beginning of the show, where we've got We've got the platform, we've got the support, but we also run, we treat it as a membership where we're giving a pile of content and a community out to help podcasters grow and succeed. And the reason that I'm mentioning that is that actually, even you know, even up until recently, you know, I've been the real face of podcast websites. And again, you and I have, have spoken about this at, at a recent mastermind. And one of the challenges that brings, which I think harks back to that idea that you mentioned of people that you know more tend to be more difficult clients. Mm. We found it at podcast websites when I was really the front and center of the brand, where because you are quite friendly and quite amiable to people, people honestly feel like they can kind of take the mick a little bit. You know, yeah. people will they will they will try and circumvent processes. They will try and <laughs> expedite things by kicking and screaming. And they'll, you know, we had one a few weeks ago that was they basically wanted exactly what he wanted, even though it was totally out of the realm of possibility. And just said, if you don't do this, I'll migrate out next week. And I just emailed back. I said, I'm really sorry, but you know, just because we know each other doesn't mean you can stamp your feet and and do all this. And I said, if you really want, I'll help you migrate out today. <laughs> um, and it, and it was because. It was because the boundary had been crossed. You yeah. know, it, it, you stop being a business, and I think that's where service-based businesses can 
really, really struggle. I mean, think about it back to your agency days. How many times do you do that little 10 minute piece of work that you don't charge because you think, well, it's only 10 minutes? Oh, yeah. And you compromise yourself. That's what it is. You know, I think I think you're absolutely right. When when the relationship isn't as involved, when there's not as much, I don't want to break it down into being about just money because it's absolutely mm-hmm. not that, but when there's not as much money on the line if there's a problem or if someone's unhappy or what have you, um, then you are less prone to compromising yourself, to allowing yourself to be taken advantage of, to allowing people to disrespect the boundaries and you know the, the 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 limits that you set on your service, on your offering, on the time you make available to your members, your customers, and all of that. And so, but yeah, with within the service industry, within clients, it's pretty much a compromise industry. Like people allow themselves to be taken advantage of that scope creep, the extra ten minutes here and there, the you know why don't we have this feature that. I never told you about, but you should have read my mind and, and guessed that I would want at the 11th hour. Like, we're more prone to allowing ourselves to be to be walked over, especially early on as well. And some a lot of that comes from this, again, it's that, that, that um, myth, I suppose, of customers always right, which was absolutely started by a customer <laughs> and not a supplier. <laughs> Like uh, you don't get that anywhere near as much when when your business is very much one to many, where your decisions are for the benefit of a wide, broad customer base, as opposed to half a dozen key clients without mm-hmm. whom you know your business would fold. Yeah, I agree, man. I think there's a couple of uh, points to, to realize as well for people running memberships or starting some kind of um, recurring based revenue platform or system, whatever it is, I think there's a couple of big points to note is that when someone thinks of themselves as a customer, they, they see things as transactional, they see things as a one-way street. I give you the money, thus I hold the power. And it's a very antiquated old way of thinking about it. And you know, we all kick off, you know, we'll sometimes have people, you know, who are justifiably annoyed at something that we've done. We might have screwed something up. You know, we all screw things up. You've got to own it and get out there and get it fixed. And <clears throat> excuse me, we'll, we'll sit here in the office and be like, damn, I can't, like, why is this person kicking off? And you know, this is unreasonable. Look, we've, this is what's happened internally. We've had this tech issue and like this person's got no right to kick off because we've had these tech issues and they don't understand that. You know, that it's not, if, if my Sky TV goes down, of course I'm annoyed. You know, if Kieran's car breaks down, of course he's annoyed. So as business owners, you get super defensive. That's the first thing that you've just got to get over. But the second thing as well is I think you've got to educate people that it's not with a membership and with even a SaaS platform, I actually don't think it's about people being customers. Mm. And I think obviously this is, this is kind of, um, this is kind of very obvious in this context, but in the SaaS world, it's not as obvious is that treating people as members, not customers. You know, we call all of our people, everyone that's podcast websites, customer, if you will, are actually treated as members. They're called members. Um, And the reason for that is I think it breeds that collective. I think it breeds that sense of group respect and it breeds that sense of being a part of something versus that, here's my money, you jump on the spot when I say because I've given you the money. Um, So I do think there's a very interesting distinction. I'm seeing a lot of um, a lot of SaaS businesses starting to approach that a little differently, you know, become a member of this platform as opposed to you are a customer of it. Um, so that's a very big distinction. I know it's very clear in memberships, but certainly mm. for for the accountants that are thinking, well, you know, I don't know if this is for me or, you know, I'm used to it. I need customers, I need clients, you know, you will have a better life by serving partners as opposed to serving customers. Yeah. And it's funny, you know, when we were both out at um, Traffic and Conversion in San Diego uh, this past February and their big take home that I saw, I didn't actually go to the keynote because I'm a terrible conference attendee. Who never, <laughs> you really are. I though. really am. I, I don't go to the sessions. I just hang out and, and chat and <laughs> eat and drink. Um, but from what I heard, <laughs> their biggest their biggest takeaway was the future of business is community. And so I, I saw people tweeting this out as though it was a big revelation. I'm thinking, well, of course it is. Like, are you only just discovering this? But when I thought more on it later, it's exactly, it's, it's, it's marrying up with what you're saying there. For memberships, the notion that your member base is community, that community is the heart and soul of what you're doing. It's what you're creating. It's what you're leading. It's what you're fostering. That's obvious for memberships. But the real way of getting ahead, if you have an atypical membership, 
um, which you could actually describe what you're doing with podcast website. Mm-hmm. It has a membership element, but that membership is it's supplementary to a, a SaaS product, which is yeah, it's a, a, something I'm going to be talking about in a future episode of the show. That approach isn't quite as obvious. And so when you understand that and embrace that and do what exactly what you're, you guys are doing, actually treating your customer base as a community of members, that's how you actually get ahead. But getting into that mindset and understanding that, when we talk about the transition from one type of business into another, the focus is usually on, okay, well, how did you get rid of your clients? How did you manage the date and the timeline? But the biggest part of it is is mental. It's changing your methodology. It's it's basically rewriting everything you know about running a business, dealing with customers. Yeah, it is. And that's something that we've really struggled with recently. You know, even though we do call people members and we have recently, it's only, I would say that it's only within the last six months that we've really embraced the idea that we don't need to be a service-based business. And that's two and a half years into this thing. Mm. And you know, realistically, it, it was a big change in mindset for both me and Kieran and, 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 and building. We've gone through some new hires recently um, and bringing in a team where it was just us two it has been very interesting because we've had to really think like a SaaS business. But also, you know, just to kind of speak to our membership side of things, like our membership, ultimately, the, the, the Success Academy that we've got, that's really a pile of added value and it is a mm. fully fledged membership. And what we're just looking at at the minute is actually, why do we make this part of our funnel? Why don't we actually build this in where we say to people, all the content upgrades, all of this, put your email address in and download this checklist and all that stuff. Why don't we put it on a free tier of the membership? Yeah. And then why don't we get people in and get them to pay actually, why don't you pay 24 bucks a month for this level one membership but actually, if you want access to the masterminds, the community, the exclusive workshops, why don't you then upgrade to the 37 bucks a month? And then do you know what? Look, you've got all this other stuff that runs your podcast. If you moved if you moved it to us for just another 60 bucks a month, actually, you'd be saving 100 bucks anyway. Yeah. You know, so it becomes this real powerful funnel where it's not just give me the e- give me the e-book, give me the give me the checklist. It's actually become part of this membership for free, or for a dollar, whatever, and just then upgrade through that path so memberships are very very interesting as i i don't see i mean you'll obviously know so much more about this in in the marketplace but i've not seen them too much be used as um as a funnel to another product obviously yes funneling up to different levels of membership but i I can't think of many places that use them as a funnel to a different product that's not coaching or a bloody retreat or something yeah yeah that's the thing you don't typically see it where that other product is something like a a SaaS product it's usually more info it's usually kind of more of the same just perhaps a little more hands-on perhaps uh, a little more intimate and private but it's coaching it's content it's community like this sort of approach though putting the membership first I think we're going to start seeing slowly but surely more people taking that that um that route and there's a few people i know in um in the the membership space i know copy blogger they used to have the free tier of their membership and then they'd upsell you not just to other info stuff but they'd upsell you to their rainmaker platform Mm -hmm. which god only knows what they're doing with it now Uh, i think they just screwed over all their customers and they've now switched to an agency for some bizarre reason but it's rare it is very very rare now with that, obviously putting the membership forward, putting it kind of front and center, uh, uh, what sort of adjustments have you already had to make to, to I suppose, make it so that your membership moves from just being an, a value add to people who primarily come in for your SaaS product to being something that stands on its own two feet? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So the Academy started life as just video workshops and some tutorials in the back end of each person's website. So we've got our custom dashboard for our members. When they log into their website, they get a custom dashboard. And we used to have the platform tutorials, like how do you do this on the on the website, mixed in with like the Academy. Oh, and by the way, here's Mike talking about memberships, you know, a 45 minute added value thing. So what we did was we split that out the beginning of the year. 
we spent some time splitting that out, rebranding it to the Podcast Success Academy. We, we might be changing. I know you and I have spoke about this. That might become the Podcast Growth Academy, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, but we actually, we, we, we purely functionally split it out. So it became its own site. It had its own community, its own forums, its own uh, content, its own, just its own everything, its own marketing, its own everything. Um, and then we, we filled it with amazing content. So we took all the workshops that we did. We did a load of content upgrades on them. We put the checklist in the resources for each one of them added a mastermind in there um we're going to add some weekly stuff in there we we we, um added some audio tutorials which we're just launching this week so we like really stacked that full of value um and then what we did was we stripped down the website dashboard learning section to just be platform tutorials so it's like okay you're in your website dashboard how do i add a picture well here's the two minute tutorial on this thing but if you want the full course the 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 seven part series on how to plan the perfect website for a launch that's in the academy um, so that, that's how we broke it out. Technically speaking, it was quite simple from our side because we just stripped out the platform. But on, on the membership side, obviously, we had to go through the process of building the membership out, um, which, which, was, which was fun. You know, it was interesting. Um, nice to tinker with it. Um, and then what we've very recently done, I mean super recently, is just worked on that marketing flow, you know, the physical. Okay, where do we, where do we put these checklists that we might do for our – so we're doing a – like a gdpr follow-up like gdpr's gone uh, no that yeah. yeah that's that's banned from this podcast yeah sorry buddy uh, i didn't mean that i meant uh <laughs> bbc2 i didn't mean i didn't mean GDPR. um but we're gonna do like a follow-up for podcasters where it's like yeah. look you, you really didn't need to be scared of this you know it's like blah 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 so the the point that i'm making is that we'll then put the upgrade the content upgrade the checklist or the video series or whatever that'll go in the academy as opposed to a put your email address in yeah um, and then they'll get upsold the free you know the free academy level um and then get upsold into the bigger tiers so they're the physical changes that we've made it's not been it's not been too crazy it's been, it's been more about um like the reasons why we're doing this, because we could have stayed the same, you know, Kieran and I earn, earn, earn decent money. Everyone does all right from podcast websites. Um, and we could have stayed at the level that we were at at the beginning of the year. Yeah. But it's like, well, we're kind of already doing this stuff anyway. So if we could triple our revenue, we're quite a lean business. So if we, to triple our revenue, we only need two key hires. And from there we can triple this thing. Um, so that's that's when the decision became quite obvious to do that, split the academy out and do the hiring. Um, but the one thing that I will say to people thinking about this is like, don't underestimate the amount of stuff you've got to create. <laughs> yes. um, you know, people think it's like this golden goose where it's you you sell it once and people keep keep buying it. Well, that's only true if there's there's consistently good stuff in there. Yeah. Um, and you need you need to be able to do. If you can't do it yourself that's when you've got to hire for this thing. Um, and we've had to hire so that we can build the business itself. And and, and it's, yeah, I think it's a mistake so many people make. I mean, I know people have launched to, you know, they've launched a membership to next to no audience. Um, and I know you spoke about this on a show, which I agreed with everything you said. Um, you know, it's they've launched to next to no audience and there's barely any content in there. And it's 50 quid a month or 100 quid. And you're just like, oh, come on, what? Like, yeah. you just, you're taking advantage of people, you know? Yeah, it's it's remembering that, you know, for as much as we like to think that someone joining our site is doing so because they love us, they worship us, and they will eat up whatever we put out, even if it's not very much. Most people, there's a, a little bit of a, what have you done for me lately? Um, kind of, <laughs> kind of streak to what they're doing and that's not to say that everyone is just kind of myopically selfish if they they join your site but you need to be able to justify them being a member some people you can get away with underserving them and not delivering value uh value doesn't always have to be content value can just be answering questions when people post them in the community you know giving people that one little quick tip that helps them overcome a big obstacle they've been struggling with Whatever form it takes, and and you know, with not want to get off too much on a tangent, whatever form that value takes, you need to make sure it's on ongoing. You need to be able to answer that question. If someone has been an active member for a year, if they sit down and think, well, actually, what have I gotten out of this membership recently? Not what did I get in my first month, because that goodwill is finite. So yeah, that's that's definitely a I'd imagine a big big part of of what needs to be on your radar now that your membership's going to be a little more central. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah, and it's something that we work hard on. You know, we'll release 
you know, our content schedule at the minute is 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 very clear that we'll do one big workshop with an expert every month. We'll then do a, a resource that matches that. We'll, we've we've developed something called a missing link resource, which is like the next the next resource, like the bit that no one ever tells you that you need. You know what I mean? It's like it's it's the missing link resource. So that's a complimentary one. Um, and then we do the, the exercises around that. So, OK, I take the workshop, take the two bits of content. Now do something with this thing. So we want to give people a quick wins. Yeah. Um, but also what we're doing is adding things like weekly coaching sessions in there where it's just 30 minutes, me on a quick on a quick sort of um, screencast. Like that's easy stuff, like 30 yeah. minutes. We can all afford that. But the value people get from that is insane um but also being really clear on saying things like okay we've added a new section for the tutorials on audio editing like really quick really quick like how do i stop this noise on audacity because if someone for us this is where you got to be really clear as a membership like what are you what are you trying to sell and yeah. as a podcaster you want to buy the successful podcast. You want to buy the fact that you can succeed as a podcast. You don't want to buy an editing tutorial. So what we, the way that we approach this is we say that by helping you crush all of these problems, like that that stupid sound on our audacity that you just can't get rid of. Like if we can help you get rid of that, there's more chance of you continuing to podcast. Yeah. Because you're not going to be put off. Yeah, and it's coming, it's it's coming around full circle to what you were saying before about about the decision-making process from making that transition from Hacksaw to podcast websites. It was about how do you want to feel? How do you want to be? What is the destination? It's not about, you know, the stuff. It's the same with when you're selling a membership. You're not just selling tutorials. You're not selling a compilation of stuff. You are selling how someone feels, what the, the net effect is. And, you know, I think too many people don't think of things that way. They think too much about, well, I just need to put in as much stuff as possible to justify the price tag. Yeah, it's not about volume, is it? It's about, it's about you know, it, it, it's about that kind of sniper shot. It's not the shotgun. It's the sniper shot that gets someone over that next hurdle. You know, you, you, you can... Do you remember the old old story that that kind of old military veteran that, that that engineer that went down on the on the warship and couldn't get it they couldn't get it moving and he went down and just hit it with his hammer, um, <laughs> and he just the, the, he invoiced him fifty grand or whatever the story is <laughs> paraphrasing it invoiced him fifty grand they said well you've only been here two minutes he said yeah I know but the fifty grand's for knowing where to hit yeah um, you know and that that's what it's about it's it's but it's about knowing when and what people need when they need it. And that's about anticipating your customers and, and, and really understanding them. Because you're right, people aren't silly. People don't buy quantity. You don't walk into a restaurant and go, give me everything. Hmm. You, you you get what you want and what you need at that time, you know? So you've got to apply that logic to your membership and, and to any, I think, to any business, to be honest. Yeah, I think, I think it's definitely something that you need to do with any type of business, but perhaps it's something that you only really fully realize and embrace when you have something that is one to many when yes. you aren't working just for a client because you know how it is you invoice or you you quote for a, a web build and it's broken down i want these features i want these pages it's a list of stuff usually as much as we'd like them to clients don't actually think about that bigger picture all of the time with a membership or with a subscription you're the person who has to think about that bigger picture you have a vested interest in working towards delivering that that bigger picture you are essentially creating the experience you're not building something for someone else and so that conversation and that equation moves a little bit more and i think it's yeah it's definitely something that is a key part certainly in our experience from moving away from working one-on-one -on -one with people where you're just doing what they're asking for to creating a membership experience that serves a higher purpose as Nambi Pambi as that sounds. No, you, you, I think you're right, man. I think, you know, you become the guide as opposed to the, the technician. Yeah. And that, that's the difference. You know, you become the guide and the, and, the, and, the, and the respected, trusted partner in that journey. You know, you become the Mr. Miyagi or the Yoda uh, as opposed to the person that's actually delivering the punches. You know, that's, that's the difference. And I think that's where there's that mutual respect that kicks in as well, where you don't get that always in the service industry, is that people understand that they're paying for you to be the guide, not for you to do everything that they say just because they've got the money. Um, so it's, it's a very big distinction. I think if you can focus on where you want to take people and all of the different different 
ways that you can take them there, that's when you really understand where the value is in your content. That's when you know what to create. You know, it's, you're not just creating random stuff. Definitely. And, you know, again, this mental side of things is a big, big part to making that switch from one type of business to another. Getting into some, a little bit more of the practical stuff as we kind of start rounding things off. When you made that switch, the podcast websites, and I'm interested in how this was for you because it went a certain way for us. With podcast websites, um, there'll have been a bit of an overlap with what you were doing with Hacksaw, but in terms of building a name for yourself in what I'd, I'd imagine is a bit of a different market, it's a more niche market of podcasters mm -hmm. versus the typical big corporates that you were working on, you work with the likes of the NHS and JCB, you know, it's, it's apples and oranges between those, those markets. How challenging did you find building a name for yourself in that new market? I know you partnered up with JLD, but you now have well established yourself within the, the podcasting niche as well. How did you find that? Did you find it challenging? Yeah, it was kind of funny. Um, you know, I live in this town, Barnes, that, that professes to be this amazingly forward-thinking tech town. <laughs> uh, yeah, honestly, man. And, you know, I've got a lot of respect for what they're trying to do with that. But I took this idea to them and, you know, wanted some help basically saying, okay, let's get involved. And, you know, can I think podcasting is going to be a big thing. No one gave a crap, man. No one gave me the time of day. And I was like, fine. Um, so that was interesting for me because I then went out and decided to really, you know what I'm like, you know me well, to know that I'm I'm like, right, okay, let's have this. So I was like, you know, interview for Guy Kawasaki, Apple. And then suddenly you've like the people that were like, well, you know, he's not, he's just looking and messing around with his podcast. They're like, can you introduce me to Guy? And I'm like, huh. no, I cannot. <laughs> um, so you, that, that was one interesting factor. But really, you know, that, that it was funny because, um, and again, you and I are quite similar to this. We're quite outspoken. We're able to stand up and talk, and we've got a level of knowledge that we're, we're able to, to bring to kind of anything. Um, and I found that it was just about going out and proving that going out and, and producing content and going out and, um, going out and speaking at the events. But it was at the same time, like you're a little bit scared to death of it. Hmm. Um, you're a little bit scared to death. Um, and that, that's just something that you've got to get on with. You've just got to go through that process and you've just got to put yourself out as much as possible. Um, and that's what I did. You know, I built that network by just being present. Like Jared at Podcast Movement, is he always jokes and takes the mick out of me for saying, you know, actually you live more in the US than you do in the UK. And it's just because I was that present, um, which is what I had to do, you know. So that, that's how I handled that. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's essentially building from scratch, building up that reputation again with a whole new market and a whole a whole different um you know audience and really i suppose it's it that comes in with the decision of recognizing that that that's what you're doing and not taking it for granted that because you've been successful in one area and one in one market that that's just transferable i think too many people take that for granted i know when we decided to go all in with memberships which, you know, that was something we edged towards bit by bit over the years, but still within the context of a service agency. When we when we dove all in and started producing the content and doing exactly what you said, you know, proving it, proving that credibility, getting up to speak, getting on um, webinars, getting on podcasts, creating, like we ended up deleting pretty much the entirety of our email list. We binned off social media accounts because they just weren't relevant like it it was it was a, a full wipe because that rep and that background that we built up in the agency side of things just didn't turn out to be very transferable did yeah, you i did get you, that did you have that yeah to a degree um probably like maybe 75% of what you had. Um, the, the, the remaining 25% would because I came from owning a digital agency and I own a SaaS business that delivers essentially the same outcome, which is yeah, a web presence. A website, yeah. um, so I was able to use some of that network, leverage some of that network and say, look, this guy's worked with Bosch and he's worked with Adobe and all these kind of different people. Um, I was able to leverage some of that equity that we built up from a brand side of things um, over the agency and bring it into podcast websites. But yeah, you know, social accounts, they were removed. I was always very careful to build my own social presence anyway yeah um you know i don't really i know we've got a podcast websites account and, and so on and so forth but i think really if you're going to be the face of the business you you've got to embrace it you can't hide behind it so i was it was never 
here's Mark's personal Twitter and then here's Mark's business Twitter. It was mm-hmm. just here's Mark and then look, podcast websites is there. Um, so yeah, to, to a very large degree, yes. Um, and I had to prove myself in the podcasting space very quickly. You know, that's um, partnering with John actually worked really, really well from us for, 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 for us and still continues to do it as a great friend of ours. But um, I think it also worked to to, to the negative as well. Um, mm. I think there were certainly certainly competitors and, and and people in the business that you know we've we've heard all sorts of rumours like oh John John gave them all the money to start. And I'm like, no, that's not true. It's, <laughs> it was all just it was all pre-sold and bootstrapped. No one's invested a penny. All oh, that whole well they're only doing all right because of John. I'm like again like if you saw where our sales come from you'd see that wasn't the case. But it's kind of nice um, to know that you're annoying people enough that they have to. <laughs> say these things it's kind of you know I th- I'm, again like you i'd thrive on that sort of stuff um so that was that was actually quite an interesting challenge to have to um go up against that to a degree as well and it wasn't certainly wasn't a big problem but i had to go out and be seen to speak you know i had to be on the stage at podcast movement i had to be doing some of the keynotes at wherever marketed live and you know i had to be doing the same kind of thing um and i, I think credibility you know the credibility signals that you get from doing that they very quickly wash away anything else that you you could possibly need to worry about. Yeah. Because the second you're on that stage delivering that, um, you know, that's that's when people really kind of. I was. I'll tell you a story about this very quickly, and I've got to wrap it. But I was. I spoke at a, a really kind of prestigious place in New York last week. I'm not allowed to say what it was, which is silly. <laughs> um, but um, I mean, like a big prestigious place. And I was in there, and I was talking about personal brand. And the idea of the entire crux of the talk was it doesn't really matter what you turn up looking like as long as you've got a level of respect and as long as you're actually treating people with a level of respect and you're not turning up in your shorts and your flip-flops, actually, it's not that much of a problem. You know, we talked about all sorts of other bits and personal brand, but that was kind of one of the core points. And someone came up to me after and said, well, do you not think you kind of, you should have put a shirt on? I was like, no, 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 I shouldn't have done it. And he said, well, you see that guy over there with a shirt? I would trust that guy more and do business with him more versus you. I was like, well, that's good because I just, you know, you've now just filtered yourself out. I'd never do business with you. Jobs are good. And thanks for that free, you know, free lead qualification. Yeah. And he, and then he said, well, yeah, but do you not get it? You're like, you've, you've, you might have, you, you've lost a potential customer. I was like, I've not lost a potential customer. I am the one that's not wearing a shirt and you're telling me I should do, but you've paid to come and watch me talk. And it was just, it was just dumbfounded by it. <laughs> um, and the, the, the point that I'm getting to with that is that, you can accelerate your credibility for your membership, for your SaaS product, for your business, like just by going out and being a bit uncomfortable, mm. you know, just by going out and doing the things that no one else is willing to like you and I have spoken about it. How, when you first start speaking, it's a little bit nerve wracking and it's a bit like, Oh, why am I doing this? But if you can do the things that the other 98% of people aren't going to do, it's going to be your membership. It's going to be your SaaS product or your business that gets the clients because you are that guy. You're the trusted guy that's up on stage telling them. Um, so, yeah, I, I know we've gone off on a tangent, but that is that is like the most valuable marketing advice I think anyone can possibly use when it comes to starting any new business. Yeah, for sure. And, uh, again, this is something that if you are coming from that more traditional client-serving role, we talked about the fact that, it's almost a little more freeing when you have something that's more one-to-many, whether it's a SaaS or a membership. It allows you to actually exert a little bit more of yourself and exert a little bit of control, not in a negative way, but in a positive way in terms of how you present yourself, how you build the type of business that is reflective of you as opposed to just kowtowing to other people's standards. But you know, so much of this, I think, that people need to keep in mind is your role then changes. It's so much more important, I think, when you're making this kind of transition for you to then go out there and put yourself forward and represent your brand and represent your business with that little bit of that higher purpose. Mm-hmm. You know? And I can't believe I've said higher purpose. I'm so not the type <laughs> of person to say higher purpose, let alone twice in one in one episode. But it does, that, that role changes in terms of you being a representative of your brand and how many people you want to reach and how uh, you know how beneficial it is to reach a, a wider audience through doing a podcast through public speaking and stuff like that so that's definitely something uh that people again need to kind of embrace when they make that switch and i think another key thing is not taking it for granted not taking for granted that the testimonials you have from your past life 
are going to be of any use. The credibility you'd built up within certain circles from your past life, don't take for granted that that's going to be of any use with your new business either. So there's some mm-hmm. stuff you can take. And I'm certainly, you know, when you whack up the client logos of who you've worked for, there are credibility um, things you can bring over from the stuff you're doing before, but don't take for granted that you can just keep doing the same things and actually recognize that's a good thing that you're not penned into the same type of marketing, the same type of of, of activities to, to market and grow and represent your business. It's a little more of a clean slate. And uh, yeah, we get so many people kind of saying, well, should I just email the same email list or should I just change my Twitter follower name? Sometimes just kind of burning it down and then putting in the work and putting in the hours and the miles to build your presence, build your influence, dem- demonstrate your credibility with a more appropriate market is is far more beneficial. It is. It is 100%. You know, that that's something that I think so many people um, – need to appreciate that they, they you know people want the shortcuts and if you're migrating over from a current business you know i could have basically gone to all hacks or clients and said you know what you can pay for this you can pay for your website on a monthly basis now i know you're not going to put a podcast on it but well it's kind of just basically the same system mm-hmm. but what would have been the point like i'd have had to convince them why they were changing the business model why it was different billing and all that it was just i could put that into just selling 10 annual plans or 20 annual plans of podcast websites like that a fifth of the effort would go into mm-hmm. doing that and it would just return and return and return and you build fans and you'd build followers and people that really enjoyed it not someone that you not someone that you had to convince to buy from you. I think if any time you've got to convince someone to buy from you, let them go buy from somewhere else and they'll come back when they get annoyed with it. Um, You know, that's, that's my approach to, uh, that's my approach to retention. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Let them go. Let them go. go. You know, know, all joking aside, seriously, if someone's already got, it's like, if you think about all the decisions you make in your life, you've pretty much already made the decision before you've said you've made the decision. You you just then go through the emotional process of figuring out actually yeah. am I am I all right saying this out loud? So well, if you think someone someone comes to you and wants to cancel, they're going to cancel. It's just how long you prolong it for. And if yeah. if you've got to convince them to come back, you'd be better off, in my opinion, letting them see what they can do without what you're providing. Because I I can almost guarantee that they will come back if they're the right people. And if they're the wrong people, like you've saved yourself a lot of headache. Without doubt, you know, I bang that drum so much. If the first time you make any effort to retain a member is when they are attempting to cancel, (laughs) it's way too late. Exactly. Yeah, you know, sometimes sometimes people need to leave in order to realize that they need to come back. And yeah, we get like 15 to 20% possible. I think it's more actually. Callie's been crunching the stats. people who leave and then come back later you know it's it's all part of a journey all right you know we i said right at the start we could easily talk about this kind of stuff <laughs> all day long i know we've taken a, li- a few little tangents but i think it's all been good stuff but i just know that at some point it's going to devolve into discussing like star wars and superhero movies <laughs> and you're going to you're going to end up spoiling the the solo movie which i haven't seen yet so let's let's Call it a day while we've got some good stuff in the can. I know that a lot of value is is going to come from people who are, are still in that stage of trying to figure out how they're going to approach that transition. Your journey, I think, has, has kind of thrown up not just some good practical stuff, but more importantly, I think the mental transitions you need to go through as well. And uh, yeah, I know that our listeners are going to love this. If people listening to this show want to learn a bit more from you, dig in a bit more to your journey, see what you're up to, where should they go? Yeah, thanks for asking, man. Um, so you can just go to uh, go to my website. You can just do a quick search for me, Mark Asquith, uh, A-S-Q-U-I-T-H. It'll come up. You'll get um, you'll get podcast websites on there. You'll get my website up there. Um, so you, you can find me just quite simply by Googling it. Um, and just I, I do a free coaching session every Friday as well for 30 minutes. So if you want to join that, just click the link and you'll be in. Awesome easy as that mark as always absolute pleasure talking to you thanks so much for coming on to the show cheers brother appreciate it 
Thanks again to Mark for coming on to the show. I loved our conversation and I just know that you guys will have gotten a lot of value from it. There's so many great takeaways from the practical side of things and how you actually have to put that date in the diary. You've got to have that date at which you stop taking on new clients and all that sort of stuff through to the actual ramifications in terms of your need to almost start from scratch building up your email list, building up your credibility and your presence and all of that sort of stuff. But I think the biggest takeaways that hopefully you've got from our conversation is the mental transition you need to go through from being someone who serves clients on a one-to-one basis, working project to project, to being a leader of a community, a membership site owner serving a bigger audience on a one-to-many basis. So I really do hope that you found this episode useful, that you found it interesting, that you've got a lot of value from it. And of course, if you want to know more about Mark, head on over to excellence-expected.com or as Mark suggested, just Google him and you'll find links to where he does his best work. Plus, if you head to themembershipguys.com slash 155, You'll find the links to Mark's website and his social profiles too. Connect with him. Let him know how much you love the interview. I'm sure he'll appreciate it. That's it from me for this week. Thanks again to Mark for coming on the show. I'll be back again next week, as always, with another installment of the Membership Guys podcast. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the Membership Guys podcast, we invite you to check out the membersiteacademy.com. The Member Site Academy is the essential resource for anyone at any stage of starting, growing and running a membership website. So whether you're still figuring out what your idea is going to be or whether your website is already up and running and you're just looking for ways to grow it and attract new members, then the Member Site Academy can help you to get to the next level. With our extensive course library, monthly training, exclusive member-only discounts, perks and tools, and a supportive, active community to help you along the way with feedback, encouragement and advice, the Member Site Academy is the perfect place to be for anyone looking to start, manage and grow a successful membership website. So check it out at membersiteacademy.com.